Okay then everybody, welcome to another Leicester Lives podcast in association with Igloo Staffing Solutions. As always, if you enjoy this podcast, don't forget to hit like, don't forget to subscribe and please do leave us some feedback by leaving us a comment. Now, in front of me today, I've got Derek Delage, DJ extraordinaire, music producer. Derek, thanks very much for coming along today, being a guest on the Leicester Lives podcast. Hey, be good to be here. Thank, thanks, for, uh, thanks for having us. Absolute pleasure, mate. Absolute pleasure. Now, you know how it starts. We like to start at the beginning and roll it all the way back. So tell us about your early years. My early years? Wow. Uh, I was born in Belfast in 1971. Mm-hmm. I lived there for about, I think, three or four years. I was, I was, I was still a baby at all. Then we moved to Leicester. Mm-hmm. Me, uh, my mum, and my dad, and my, my three brothers. Uh, we landed in Leicester. I lived in the first house we lived in, Evington, was on Fernview Road. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we had a lovely little house there on Fernview Road. And yeah, I can, my earliest, my earliest, they were my earliest memories of Leicester. I remember being very aware that we were Irish. Mm-hmm. I had Irish accents then. Mm-hmm. This was the 70s. Yeah. Uh, so there was the, you know, there was there was a, there was a war going on in Belfast and mm. in, in Ireland at the time, and they started to bring the war over here. So yeah, we, you know, we experienced a bit of anti-Irish feeling. But on the whole, yeah, the, my early days, yeah, were I had a real happy upbringing. Mm. I was going to say, why why Leicester, Derek? Why why was it Leicester that you came to? I asked my dad that same question many many times, mm. and I don't know if a lot of people are aware of this, but in the 70s, Leicester was one of the boom cities. It was mm. one of the wealthiest cities in Europe mm. per, per head of population. I think it was, uh, yeah, it was it was a booming city. Mm. You know, it, was, uh, it was a good place to come uh, and start a business mm. and raise a family, you know. It was, yeah. I, think, I think it's had a lot to do with the hosiery uh, industry, mm. but it, it was a boom industry. You know, mm. It was a real, it was a, it was a successful affluent city. Yeah. Then in that part of the seventies, yeah. when we arrived, that's that's what drew my dad there. Yeah. So he thought, yeah, that's the place for me. <laughs> so tell us about those early years, that upbringing, schools and schools, friends and uh, primary school. I went to Linden Primary School, mm. uh, which is in sort of on the edge of Evington and Crown Hills. Right. Uh, do you remember a pub called The Lively Lady? Yeah, yeah, I do. It's right yeah, near The yeah. Lively Lady. And there was a big waitrose at the bottom. That's right. Yeah, I went to Linden Primary. My foot, my, yeah. And that was funny. I, I st- I'm still in contact with one, one guy who I went to primary school with. I don't know if you know a fellow called Smack from Leicester. Mm. He went to the same primary school as me. Right, never knew that. Smack at the football. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I saw Smack the other day. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, you know, and I got chatting to him one day with... For some reason, the lively lady came up. I said, mm. I went to school near there. <laughs> I went to Linden Primary. I went, I went to Linden Primary. I think he was a year older than me or a year younger. I couldn't quite work it out. So, yeah, they were kind of happy days. Mm. Happy days. Uh, and then we uh, then we moved from uh, from, Thurnview, uh, from Thurnview Road. We moved up to Station Road. Right. Which is on the, it's right on the border of Thurnby, Thurnby Lodge. And sort of, what's the other place? Bushby. Yeah, I oh, know. Right, yeah. I, mean, I live right opposite the Swallow Pub, right. which is best. If you cross the road, you're in Thurnby Lodge. Mm. If you cross the, the other side of the road, you're in Thurnby. Mm. So I live right on the border there. Uh, and that was, as a kid, that was a real mad place to grow up. Mm. We, spent, we spent all our time hanging out in Thurnby Lodge, you know mm. what I mean? Because it was more fun. Yeah. The estate kids were a better laugh. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Even though we kind of lived in the posher part, we were we hung out in Fernby Lodge. We, we grew up on the lodge, basically. Yeah. Uh, after I left primary school, went to a school called City of Leicester School. Yep. Which is the same school Gary Lineker went to. That's right. Uh, same school Emil Heskey went to. Yeah. Alistair Campbell. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. I did not know that. And the thing is, uh, I think years and years and years ago, that school was a good school. Mm. Uh, my mum had heard it was a good school. I think it used to be an all boys school, City Boys. Mm. But believe you me. When when I went there, it was it, it wasn't it wasn't a very good school. Yeah. I wasn't particularly interested in learning yeah. school anyway. I think if you wanted to succeed academically, you could. But I think years and years ago, it was it was a good school. But it, you know, it was quite wild, really. Yeah, my, my growing up there was quite wild. I was quite as a kid, I was a I was a bit of a rebel. You know what I mean? Mm. A bit of a hellraiser. Not a bad kid. Mm. Not an evil person. But yeah, I was I, I was rowdy. I was a bit of an upstart. Mm. 
So, yeah, it was fun. I mean, and it was a great place to go because that sort of catchment area had loads of other schools. We had Spencefield there, mm -hmm. right on the, we were right next door to Spencefield School, which years later we, we, we would amalgamate with. Mm -hmm. And then you had Judge Meadow, then you had St Paul's. Yep. So like you had like four big schools really, really close to each other. So like when it snowed, it was brilliant. We'd all be having snowball fights <laughs> on a tennis course. And when we, we ended up, uh, Spencefield and City of Leicester ended up, the schools amalgamated. Mm -hmm. So, we thought this can go either way, you know what I mean? But it didn't. The first few days of school, we kind of realised all their top lads were there and all our top lads were there. We all became mates. Yeah, yeah, We yeah. integrated really uh, a lot better than I think anyone would have would have imagined, mm. you know what I mean? And, of course, there was a, there was the upside of, like, the hot new girls in school and they were thinking the same. We're going to school with new girls. and All the lads got on well. Yeah. And we formed a gang. We were called the CRS. <laughs> Uh, we took our name from the French riot police, yep. the City Riot yep. Squad. So that was our name. And we had, <laughs> we had, we had uh, many battles with Judge Meadow, many battles with St Paul's. Yeah, there were good days. There were good days. This was the start. This would have been the early 80s, you know. Uh, so, yeah, this was, this was, it was Stature then, do you know what mm. I mean? It was Stature, it was the 80s. Yeah. It was, uh, it was, it was kind of, it was, it was grim, but it was good. Yeah. Uh, I loved growing up in the 80s. The music was amazing. The fashion was amazing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I was new romantic briefly, and then I just went straight into casual. Do you know what yeah. I mean? I loved the old casual look. Pioneering times, weren't they? Oh, yeah. yeah. Funnily enough, there was a great shop called Pioneer Inlet. There was, there was, yeah. Sell, yeah. That, that used to sell quite some really, really smart gear. So, yeah. you know, it was... I loved growing up in Leicester. I mm. do. I mean, the football team was shit, but it was brilliant. I loved going to Filbert Street. Yeah. It was, you know I mean? It was, it was, I'll never forget the first time I ever went to Filbert Street. I can't remember. I think we played Ipswich. I think we were in division, the old division two then. Mm. And I'll never forget it. You know, the first time I smelt those hot dogs and the onions. Yeah. Cigarette smoke and cigar smoke. Yeah. And, you know, alcohol off met other men's breath. And yeah. Load of big guys with sheepskin <laughs> coats and my father was he was a big guy himself yeah big northern irish guy he knew everybody and everybody knew him mm. it was really exciting Got, i'll never forget going to that game and we walked into the center stand and walked up all these stairs and the crowd and, and i walked out and i'll never forget i looked at the pitch yeah how green it was and how big it was i was like oh, i've never seen anything like it yeah and every time leicester were on the tack everyone used to bang their heels it was an old wooden stand yeah, that's right stand, yeah and it used to rock and make a hell of a noise like the Zulus banging the shields yeah <laughs> you know, it, was, it was it was brilliant yeah I love growing up in Leicester so did you have any idea what the future would hold for you at that time Derek any sort of interest any sort none of career whatsoever, path none yeah whatsoever I I, I, I didn't actually I, I wasn't an academic at school mm. you know what I mean I, I, if I applied myself I could have been but mm. I just didn't like school it was like it was fun do you know what I mean but it wasn't fun you know I uh, I used to go home at lunchtime because I would get in so much trouble. Mm. And I worked out that I got in the most trouble in the dinner hour. Mm. So I thought, fuck this, you know, I'm sleeping I thought, f I used to go home for my dinner. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because, yeah, I wasn't, I, I did, I, I spoke to my younger brother the other day and, and this is going back to when, I, when I, we lived in Thurnview Road and every Sunday morning I used to go down and I used to listen to Tony Blackburn mm. on the radio on Sunday mornings with my headphones on. And my, I don't remember saying this, but my younger brother, Said, says like even when you was a little kid you told me that that, that you were going to be a DJ mm. I don't remember doing that mm. he's adamant that that's what I said so <laughs> yeah no I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do yeah I mean we uh, we left Leicester in 1987 right uh, which I was furious about I didn't want to leave you mm. know what I mean I was like what, what do you mean we're, we're moving back to Ireland I was like I don't want to fucking go back there yeah so were you 15, 16 at this yeah, time yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I was the youngest person in, in, in my year at school. I mm. should have been in the... In, in, yeah, I was about 15. Mm. I said, I don't want to, I, I don't want to leave. I didn't want to leave Leicester. You know, yeah. My friends were here. I grew up here. Yeah. So it was a real wrench to leave and to go back to Ireland. But you know what? After, ba after being back in Ireland for a week, it was brilliant. You know what mm. I mean? It was great. I enrolled in a college there. Mm. Didn't go. I spent most of the time uh, hanging around snow crawls, smoking dope and drinking beer. You mm. know, that's and uh, that went on for a few years. But uh, yeah, I'll never forget it. I was uh, I was devastated when I had to leave Leicester. Yeah. Because I was just hitting puberty, do you know what I mean? I was just, well, I'd hit puberty, I hit puberty quite early, but you know, I was becoming mm. a man. Yeah. You know, and I thought, 
it was quite daunting. Even though I had a lot of family in Ireland, I, I just didn't want to leave. Yeah. It, 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 it was a real wrench and I cried. I, I'll never forget that that we come out of our house on a, on Spencefield Lane. Mm. We'd moved from, from, from Thurnby to Evington then. And I cried, man, I cried. I, I, mm. cried, I cried all the way, all the way up to Strenroll where we got the ferry. Mm. Mm. So what were you doing for work when you left school then, Derek? Uh, like I said, I went back to Ireland, mm. went to college, didn't do anything. And my old man said, listen, he said, this is this not for you here. Yeah. He said, uh, and I had an uncle that lived in London. So he said, do you fancy going over? You, your uncle says you get your job. Mm. Do you want to? Do you fancy going over to London? I said, yeah, to, mm. let's go, man, yeah. let's go. So I landed. Uh, but my uncle Trevor's, he was a bit of a Leicester legend as mm. well. Uh, and yeah, he lived in this big house in Kensington. And he said, yeah, don't worry. The first couple of weeks, he said, just find yourself. You know? mm. Just find your feet. And I got a job. Uh, selling photocopiers, mm. fax machines. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the the most the most senior members watching will remember those things: mm -hmm. photocopiers and fax machines. So I was this sixteen-year-old kid. This was in nineteen ninety. Yeah, I think I, I think I, I left Ireland on January the third, and on January the fourth, I was walking down uh, Kensington High Street in a T-shirt. Coming from Northern Ireland, got here. Mm. I thought this isn't cold. Everyone was looking at me like I was a madman. <laughs> you know, it was probably just, you know, just above the minuses. But to yeah. me, it was weird. This was this was like tropical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. T-shirt on, walking down Kensington High Street. Yeah, so I got a job in the city, selling fax machines and photocopiers. I was this sixteen-year-old kid in a in a pinstripe suit, mm. the brogues, you know, the the braces. of you know, I was. Walking down Liverpool Street like I was Gordon Gecko from mm. Wall Street, I was going to be this big captain of industry, and you know I was quite good at it for a while. Mm. But then I discovered this thing called Acid House, mm. and decided to grow my hair long and listen to house music, and go to warehouse parties, and go to clubs, and take ecstasy. So <laughs> the sort of career in the city kind of it petered off you know yeah I, I was going to say the photocopiers became a little less exciting yeah yeah, yeah. they uh, yeah I just thought you know what I'll park that up for a while mm. I'm having fun doing this and obviously I, I loved music and uh, I used to go to this club called the Brain Club and uh, the guy that you know the guy whose club it was he was a uh, he, he was a promoter. His name was Sean McCluskey. He was mm. in he was in a band called the Joe Boxers. Oh yeah, yeah. In the eighties, and I used to, I just used to be so on his case. Go on, let me DJ, let me DJ. Mm. And uh, I was in a band at the time, mm. which was like we were in a band called Trafalgar. Mm. We were going to be like the uh, the new Happy Mondays or the new, new Stone Roses. Yeah, so, yeah, I, mean, yeah. I couldn't play an instrument. I don't know what <laughs> I was doing in the band. But, yeah, we formed a band which never really went anywhere. But because I'd love music. Because I had records, I started to blank, sort of blank gigs. Yeah. You know, oh, let me do the warm up set, you know what mm. I mean? And then before I knew it, I got quite good at it. Yeah, just purely self taught. Just, yeah, yeah. I mean, ex that's exactly how it was. Do you know what I mean? And I, I just, I just blanked the gigs, mm. you know? And word got around and I became, I, mean, I was good at it. So I started to get more and more work. And then I actually made a record, uh, which become like quite an underground hit, you know. Mm. Uh, so before I knew it, I was, I gone from this kid who was hustling, mm. you know, to get DJ work, to like I, I had a booking agent, and, mm. you know. I was like I was getting paid to to, to DJ here and there, and mm. then before I knew it, this records became sold loads of copies and became critically acclaimed and mm. I was getting booked to DJ, I'd become an international DJ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was getting booked to play abroad and shit like that. Yeah. I was flying business class and yeah, it, 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 it was amazing. And, and what sort of time, sp time span are we talking about here? You know, well, the, over a year, couple of years or? Well, I kind of, I was getting a little bit of work around the 93, 94, mm. 1993, 94 and then when I made the record and there was a record label called Wall of Sound, which was just starting then. And I gave it to them. And obviously they liked it and they put it out. So it really started to escalate about 95, mm. from 95. And from then on, it just it just, it just grew, man. Yeah. Before I knew it, I was, uh, 
I was an international DJ. Yeah. Uh, DJing all over the world, you know, the best clubs, the biggest clubs. Mm. Yeah, they were great times, man. I'm sure, I'm sure. What was the what was the first overseas booking? I think I went to Belgium. Mm. I think I think I DJed. I think I DJed. It was either Belgium or somewhere in Scandinavia. Mm. I was really popular in Belgium because because of my record. It was a real big hit there. Mm. I think I got to number one in the Belgian national charts. <laughs> but uh, great, obviously, like Europe was brilliant then. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It was, uh, yeah, it was. It was. I was just buzzing on the fact people were playing me to play my favourite records. Yeah. They were flying me, they were putting me in a nice hotel, and they was paying me. Yeah. And I was, you know, and like, yeah, it was just, it was, it was, yeah, it was brilliant. You know what I mean? It was. Uh, just to put, just to put some sort of context onto it, there, Derek. You know, I mean, early nineties travel wasn't as easy as it is now, is it? You know, um, nah. I remember going to the, you know, the World Cup in nineteen ninety in Italy. You know, and there weren't that many flights going out there. You know, we, I think we paid. 250 quid for our flight out. I mean, I wouldn't pay 250 quid for a flight to Italy now, you know, yeah. and yet I was paying it 30 odd years ago, so. Yeah, I mean, it was, no, it was, I was very fortunate at the mm. time, you know, because, uh, yeah, but well, we were kind of in demand and then mm. you have to remember now it was, it was, it was, it was getting into the, to the time of cool Britannia, Tony Blair just come into power. Yeah. Like the, the the economy was booming. Mm. I mean, bars and restaurants and clubs were opening up everywhere. Yeah. Everyone seemed to have money. Everyone was going out three or four nights a week, mm. and I think that was the same all over Europe. Yeah. So yeah, they were uh, great times. So when did Ibiza become a big thing in your life? You know what? I didn't go to Ibiza until 1997. Mm. You know, um, people were people have been partying there since the early 80s. Mm. Uh, well, they've been partying there since the dawn of time. You know what I mean? It was like since the Romans were there, and mm. the Phaeacians and all that. It's it's been synonymous as a party island. Uh, but I first went to Ibiza in 1997. Mm. I, I was I was flown out to play at Mania Mission. Mm. That was my first Ibiza gig. I loved it. I said, "What a place!" I mean, I heard this place was good, but I didn't think it was this. Mm. Good, you know, and. Uh, yeah, I thought that was right at the end of the season. It was mm. like sort of September time. Mm. And I thought, I, I remember saying to the promoter, you've got to book me to play here again. I, yeah. love it. I love it. And then the next year, 98, the year of the World Cup, mm. 98, yep. they they flew me out, Mike and Claire from Manumission, they flew me out to do the opening of uh, the opening party. And what Manumission had done, they taken over this old converted uh, it's an old converted brothel mm. but uh, just on the outskirts of a beat and they turned it into a motel mm. it was beautiful inside it was really palatial it had like white marble floors and mirrors everywhere mm. some can baths in, mm. in every room water beds in every room yeah I mean, it's pretty tacky but it was cool yeah 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 and they'd taken over this old converted brothel and that was where all the DJs and all, all, and all like everyone would come and when you were playing in the beat they Everyone would come and stay there, and, and there was a there was a bar downstairs which they converted into a club, mm. which, was, which was called uh, the Pink Pussy. Mm. Painted pink. It was amazing. Uh, yeah, it was like just I, I just, went out. I went out there to uh, to play mm. just to, just to play for the opening night, and I remember saying to uh, Mike and Claire, I said, "This place it really blew my mind. Is the place was amazing. It's like I've never seen anything like it. Mm. It's like it was." It was like, it was just debauchery on, on every level. Well, that's what I was going to say. I mean, describe to people what Manumission was all about, because a lot of people know, but an awful lot of people don't know as well. It's one of those things that you had to kind of see to, be see to believe. I mean, mm. it, was, it was in the Guinness Book of Records as, as the biggest club night in the world. Mm. So you've you got this amazing venue, this amazing club, which used to be called Coup, but mm. then they changed name to, to Privilege. Mm. But it's this huge club. It's got a swimming pool in the middle of it. It holds thousands and thousands mm. of people. And on every Monday night, they had, had a night there called Man Mission, mm. which is by far un unquestionably the greatest club night ever. Mm. I've ever been to, I've ever DJed that. I've never seen anything like this. It was unbelievable. Had a swimming pool in the middle of it. And the, the two promoters, Mark and Claire, really cool guys. Mm. But like halfway through the night, they'd come on stage and they'd do like a sex show, mm. like a live sex show. Mm. Mike and Claire and loads of other girls mm. and a few guys. Mm. 
and he'd just be like this mental spectacle. I never, I didn't get this. I was, I did one sex show with him. I don't remember too much about it, <laughs> but uh, it was funny. I, I remember being blindfolded and yep. tied to a chair. Yeah. Uh, and that's about all. Do you know what I mean? I didn't go sort of full tilt, but yeah, I, there was a bit of titillating going on. Was that something that was expected, or was it something you, you volunteered know what? They for? They stuck it on me. They stuck it on me just before they were about to go on stage. I said, "Yeah, I'll do it." Why not? <laughs> I, I was a little bit high. Yeah. I was high. I was I was in party mode. So, so what are your what are your main sort of memories of Manu Mission? You know, now looking back, obviously, uh, it was just playing at the best playing at the best club in the world, mm. uh, living in a place called the Manu Mission Motel, which was just relentless. Mm. I mean, you couldn't sleep in it. Mm. I mean, I've hardly ever slept there. Do you mm. know what I mean? They hired like these twelve strippers from New York to come over. And to, to, to work in, in the club and, and in the motel. Mm. So imagine living with 12 strippers from New York <laughs> and Mike and Claire. My bedroom was next door to their bedroom. So it was just one long party. Yeah. It was just sex, drugs, and, and debauchery, man. Yeah. It was hilarious. And obviously, they fly in to TJ a lot. Happy Mondays played the opening night that night. Mm. On a, and I, I mean, partying with Sean Ryder was hilarious. Partying with Grace Jones was hilarious. Mm. Kate Moss, Noel Gallagher, Jean Paul Gaultier. Mm. Diego Maradona. I mean, yeah. I went on a went on a three day bender with Diego Maradona. <laughs> How did that come about? Well, I'm I'm in this club called Space, mm. and I'm like, someone said that Maradona's here, mm. and a mate of mine knows his manager. Mm. And I said, could you introduce me to him? He went, yeah, yeah. So we've gone in this like the club space itself is like I, I used to but when I DJ there, I DJ there's an outdoor bit called the terrace, mm. and that's where I used to hang out. But there's an indoor bit as well, which is huge inside. It looks like space. You know? mm. And he was in there. He, he'd had this VIP area all cordoned off. So he's there. He's there with about 10 birds. You know what I mean? He's Colombian girls, or I don't know, Colombian or Brazilian or whatever, Spanish. But he's there with a couple of his mates. And they've got like, there's all like champagne and vodka and everything on ice. They've got all this fruit and, and fruit on ice. And they're mm. sitting there like Caligula, do you know what I mean? <laughs> evening, you know? Obviously the music's player and I speak a little bit of Spanish. Mm -hmm. Like his, his Spanish, is, it was a, his English is about as good as my Spanish. Mm. He refuses to speak English anyway. I think he can speak better English. But anyway, I was like, hey. shook his hand, shook the hand of God. Mm. And before we knew it, the party moved on somewhere else and moved on somewhere else and moved on somewhere else. I took him back to the Manu Mission Motel mm. very briefly. I was like, I've gone back there and there was no one there. Mm. Like, fucking sod's law, innit? Do you know what mm. I mean? I brought the Agat Maradona back to the Manu Mission Motel. <laughs> there was no one there. Then we ended up in some villa party, which like by then it was a, it got a bit dark and a bit twisted. I was like, I'd been out for two days on this on the spin anyway. Mm. You know what I mean? But, but yeah. That, that was funny, hang, hanging out party with Diego Maradona. And what about Grace Jones? Because, I mean, she was known as a fiery character, wasn't she? Yeah, I mean, she she did a... She, there was, like, this big sort of... It was, like, a one-day festival there. I, I can't remember who played, but she was one of the artists there. And I remember... I actually, I actually was behind the stage while she was doing a live performance. Mm. And she would run behind... She, she goes through about... Five costume changes mm -hmm. every song, do you know what I mean? every other song. Do you know what I mean? I didn't get to spend that much time with her, but I saw her work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I partied with her. I've been on the same dance floor with her, mm -hmm. so I'm fierce. And, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, she's an amazing. To see. She looks like an alien. She doesn't look human. Yeah, you know what I mean, she's got a real look about her. She's, yeah, she, her, 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 she, she's this real star, man. When you see her perform, she's mind blowing. So there must have been times, Derek, when you were thinking, you know, how did this kid from Belfast Stroke, yeah. Leicester, suddenly end up at... What the fuck's going on here was yeah. basically what I thought, yeah. 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 And, yes, yeah, it was like, I was living the dream. Mm. Before that so term living the dream was was even coined. Mm. I mean, it was yeah, it was just fantasy. I, mean, yeah. like, it was, I didn't have a care in the world. Like, I went out I went out there for the opening night and I said to, to, to Mike and Claire promoters I mm. said to them I'd love to play here every week and they said well you can if you want mm. I said what he said no why don't you stay mm. so obviously I mean I was really successful DJ anyway mm. so I had to blow out all these bookings in England yeah do you know what I mean which didn't go down too well which is a bit unprofessional yeah but looking back I would never have had that summer 
Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? I was going to say, these these opportunities don't come around every two I, minutes, do they? I, yeah. That's what I said to myself. Yeah. I said, when am I ever, ever going to get a chance mm. to do this? You know? So, yeah, I mean, it was... It was like living the dream this year. Yeah. It was Fantasy Island, man. It was like Disney World for adults. Mm. Days turned into nights. I mean, I was earning more money than I knew what to do with. Yeah. Girls. I met some of the funniest guys in the world. I had some really, I had, you know, I had a real tight mate out there. Mm. I had a real sparring partner, do you know? Yeah. Where I, could, where I could go, get away from all the madness, do you know? <laughs> I mean, I could go and hang out with him. He was as mad as me anyway. He was a great guy, streaky. How does it? How does all this affect you mentally, Derek? Because you know it's it's. I mean, hard partying does take its toll after a while, oh, doesn't it? I mean that. Yeah, I mean it really did. Uh, yeah, it's. I mean, there's only so much you can do. Yeah, you know, there's only so much you can do. In 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 later years, you know, it 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 took its toll. Mm. I was a younger man then. Yeah, you know, and getting. Doing that in your late twenties is a bit different different than doing it in your late thirties. Sure, sure. And it took a real toll on me. Yeah. You know, I don't drink anymore, I don't yeah. do drugs anymore. Yeah. I'm recovering at it. I'm in recovery now. Yeah. It nearly killed me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it nearly, nearly killed me. I had some of the greatest times in my life, but drugs and alcohol nearly killed me. Yeah. You know? They nearly drove me insane. But they did drive me insane, do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, addiction is a form of insanity, you know. It nearly killed me. We'll come back to that in a moment because that should be a really interesting point. But just to sort of pick up where we are, you've got this summer in Ibiza, yeah. manumission, resident DJ. Do you think it's going to go on forever at this stage? I was just... Before I said that, when you asked me what it was like, I thought it would last forever. Yeah. I really didn't... I, 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 no, I was so far from... I was so far flung from reality yeah. at this point. I thought this would go on forever. I mean, I knew that it shut down in the winter... So I didn't think it would be going on all year, but mm. that, I just thought, you know what? I'll just I'll go back to England. I'll pick up where I left off. Yeah, it? and that's exactly what I did. Mm. It went on for three years. I mean, I had three uh, th- three years out there. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Most people have three summers out there, but I mean, I got there in May and didn't come home till sort of sort of late November. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, it's a very, there's a very different place in the winter there. I mean, now there's a lot of people live there all year round. Mm. But yeah, it got it got the it's just the wall started closing in on me down there. Yeah, it's, it, it's an island as well. Sure. So you know, the, you, you're very aware that you're on an island, mm. especially when everything's shut down and mm. it just gets dark and it's winter and there's no mm. one around. You know? Yeah, you yeah. Get, and you see the same people all the time, and it's just like everyone looks a bit mad or strange and. You, know, you think that, and it's, you get a bit paranoid. <laughs> <laughs> and the drugs played a big part of that as well, obviously. Here's something I've always wondered, Derek. You know, I mean, you've got Ibiza, which is synonymous with drugs. You know, you can't mention the two without nah. sort of harking back to the whole sort of dance music theme of the island. What's the authorities' view on drugs? Because, I mean, obviously, they're turning a blind eye. Well, look, I don't think the Spanish economy could survive. Mm. Without drugs, yeah. I mean, I think the amount of money, the amount of the people that are earning the money out of the drug dealer are putting money back into the Spanish economy. Aren't sure, they? It's, I, I don't think that the Spanish uh, uh, economy could survive. Mm. I mean, I don't know what it's like now, but then they, uh, I mean, if you got caught selling it, like in the clubs, you, you were banging trouble. Yeah, I mean, I remember. I was coming back from San Antonio one night and he was a plain closed. He was a plain closed. He was in the Guardia Civil. Like, there's mm. three coppers in Spain. There's, 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 the, there's the locals. Mm. They've got blue shirts. There's the nationals. They've got the white shirts. Mm. And then there's the, the Guardia. Mm. They're the ones in the green shirts. Mm. They're like the military police. Right. But it, so if you get caught by... If you get caught by... By the locals, you're all right. Mm. Get caught by the nationals, you've got a little bit. Mm. But if you get caught by the Guardia, you're fucked. Sure. Because they beat the shit out of you, yeah. you know what I mean? And, and they'll arrest you and you'll end up going to prison. If, if, you know, if you've got a larger, like, if you're selling, do you know what I mean? Like, if you're shot in bags of pills, mm. you know, you're going to go to prison. Yeah. And I remember uh, I was coming out of San Antonio and I, got, as I was walking, this guy just appeared from nowhere. It didn't look like a copper, do you know what I mean? But he was. He stopped me like that. Tried to search me. 
then obviously he pulled a tiny bag of cocaine out like that and I just looked at it, I thought, all right, here we go. Mm. And he looked at me and went, you did it? I was like, yeah. He said, money mission? I went, yeah. He said, give me back my cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> I said, where are you going? I said, I'm going back to the B3. Well, come on, I'll give you a lift. <laughs> so that, I was fortunate there. Yeah, very, yeah. But uh, now, I don't think the Spanish economy could survive. Yeah. I don't think, That's what I wanted to I be fair, think, yeah. I mean, they, they don't turn a blind eye to it, but they know it goes on. Sure. I mean... How's it get? It's an island. How the fucking hell does it get there in the first place? Yeah, of course, yeah. Somebody must be greasing the wheels along the way. I don't yeah. know the ins and outs of it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I don't think... Yeah. Look, Acid House would never have happened if it wasn't for... If it wasn't... It, the drug and the music, there wouldn't be one without the other. Correct, I yeah. I don't really don't think there would. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, it's... Have a look at it. I mean, if, if, if there wasn't for drugs, there wouldn't be the clubs. mm and I think they know that. I, I, mean, I don't know the ins and outs. Mm. I, I, I do know this. I don't think the I don't think the, the economy mm. could survive without without. Yeah. It. No, that, that's interesting. Like I said, it's just something I wondered, and you pretty much confirm what I'd always thought. To be fair, so when does it all end in Ibiza? Then you said about the three the three years. You know was what? this your choosing or? It was. It, it all started. It kind of knows Doris for me around the millennium mm. after sort of after 2001 two, then my career sort of yeah it kind of nosedived from there you know I, I was I was drinking more I was taking you know, I was taking a lot more drugs mm. started getting a lot less work became a bit of a loose cannon yeah a bit of a liability yeah people didn't want me around people didn't want to book me anymore mm. so it's a shame mm. but that's what happened yeah that's what happened. Slight inevitability to it. Yeah, I mean, it it it's it was it it wasn't sustainable. Mm. Looking back at it now, yeah, that type of lifestyle, yeah, that behaviour, it's not sustainable, mm. you know. So, after three years, what what happens now? Well, I mean, I still DJ now and again. Mm. I mean, I don't have an agent. Mm. Uh, I've got a great life now. Mm. I'm happier now than I've ever been. Mm. I mean. I'm not flying around the world, I'm not earning thousands of pounds an hour, you know, but I'm not, I'm not frying my brain. You know mm. I mean, I'm not drinking myself to death. Do you yeah. Know I mean? And I'm not, I'm not a liability anymore. You know, I'm, I'm happy now. Life's good. Well, let's go back to what we were talking about with addiction then. When did you realise your lifestyle was problematic? I think, it, I think it's, it was always in the back of my head, mm. that, you know, that, that this is not normal, you know, you know, you're, burning the candle at both ends or mm. tripping the light, fantastic, what you want to call it. But my capacity for it was, you know, I could, uh, I could, go, I could, I could, party, I could party with the best of them. I yeah. could go for days. Yeah. Didn't touch the sides. Yeah. Which is a, a plus and a minus, isn't it, yeah, really? I yeah. I mean, there are quite a few, I mean, there are quite a few DJs that like that. I mean, there was a magazine, uh, there was a, uh, a music magazine called Music. Mm. And they, they had this thing called Caner of the Year and, uh, different DJ or someone in the music industry mm. would would win it and I won that uh, there's quite a few other DJs that have won it that mm. are they no longer drink mm. they no longer take drugs mm. some are in recovery some of them aren't but yeah I kind of knew I mean I kind of knew when I was doing it yeah. that it wasn't sustainable and it, you know it wasn't going to end well mm. but you're so far flung it you know? yeah. you're doing it <laughs> <laughs> so when was that when was that moment when you thought things have got to change? Well, it would have been about, about ten and a half, ten and a half years ago. Mm. Really. I've been, you know, I've been, I've been clean and sober now for, I'll be eleven years in September. Mm. So yeah, ten and a half, eleven years ago, I just woke up one morning and I had enough. I couldn't do it anymore. Yeah, something inside, this an internal thing. You know, I, I had. People talk about rock bottoms. I had hundreds of those, man. Mm. You know what I mean? I just kept drilling. Yeah. I kept drilling through the rock to another rock. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. It was an internal thing with me. Some I just, some inside, I thought, I can't do this anymore. Man. Yeah. I've had enough. Yeah. I reached out to someone who I knew didn't drink anymore mm. uh, and surrendered, really. Mm. And did you find it easy? Stopping's easy. It's staying stopped. That's yeah. Hard, you know yeah. What I mean? uh, I uh, I couldn't have done it without the help, man. Do you know mm. what I mean? I'm uh, I'm still in recovery now. You know? mm. 
I go to meetings, I help other people. Mm. I help other recovering addicts. That's what it's about. Yeah. It's, what was your lowest point? The lowest point was was, was was that morning I woke up, I think it was September the 13th. Mm. It was just after that, that England, 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 uh, I think they played against, was it the Ukraine? I don't know if it was the one where it's, where it, in the Euros, when? No, I think it was a qualifier, and they didn't qualify. I think McLaren was... The oh, yeah, Wally in the Broly, that, yeah, that yeah. game, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. sat in that night on my own. Croatia, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Croatia, it wasn't yeah. Ukraine. I sat in that, and I watched that game on my own, which is depressing enough as it is. Mm. Uh, I just sat there with a bottle of vodka and a, and a bag of cocaine. And I just finished it off, and I was like... I knew, I, I knew there wasn't any more, and it was just like I just went to bed. I woke up the next day, and I just... I couldn't, I couldn't. I couldn't live my life like that anymore. Mm. You know what I mean, I knew I had a problem, but you know, I didn't know how to stop doing what I was doing. Mm. You know, obviously, I'd been, my life was at a real low point then. You know, yeah. like, relations with friends, family. Yeah, just my life was shit. Man, yeah, you know I, mean? I just didn't want to. I, I said to myself, I don't want to feel like this anymore. Yeah. I don't want to feel like this again. Yeah, yeah. And that's when. That's. That's when that's that's that that was the start of the beginning, you know. Yeah, yeah. What's your view on drugs in society now? Because you know you've gone from one extreme to another. You know, you're now in sobriety. Yeah, I mean, look, I think there's always going to be drugs. I mm. mean, it's a bit different now. I think kids are taking different drugs. They're uh, prescription drugs. Mm. Everyone's doing them now, aren't they? Mm. Ketamine. Mm. I mean, I've tried ketamine a few times, but it just didn't do anything for me. Mm. I mean, heroin's an epidemic, isn't it? Mm. If you look at America, it's all, it's all fentanyl, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. Synthetic heroin. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, it'd be... Uh, I'm not anti-drug, man. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm not anti-drug. Mm. Pro-recovery. Mm. Anti-drug, you know what I mean? If I, you know, if I could take drugs with impunity... And, didn't fuck up my life then mm. I should be doing it yeah I can't yeah no. what's your views on the legalisation of drugs uh, I mean there's arguments for it and there's mm. arguments against it isn't yeah. there I mean the government are only going to fucking tax us aren't they mm. they legalise yeah. it yeah uh, I mean I think it's ridiculous that marijuana isn't yeah, it's decriminalised most places now, anyway. Mm. But uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. To be, I don't really have an opinion on that. I mean, yeah. it's a strange one, isn't it? I mean, it was something I was thinking about this week anyway. And I mean, it's hardly likely to happen because we've got a government who's trying to ban smoking for goodness' sake, yeah. let alone any yeah, other. Well, they, drug. I, I, it, they're trying to pass that law that it, it, if you're over a certain age, you won't be able to buy it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's insane, isn't it? R- ridiculous, yeah. ridiculous. All kids are vaping now. Aren't they? That's right. That's right. And we don't know what's in these vapes. We don't know. We don't know what that's, what that's. It just looks stupid. It smells ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Somebody eating a donut. <laughs> you no. Know? But uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's an argument for it, mm. and there's an argument that marijuana is a gateway drug, which is to what. It, I mean, look. What's the most deadliest drug on the planet? Alcohol. Mm. Alcohol's killed, Absolutely, killed yeah. more people, wrecked more lives yeah. than anything else. Yeah, continues to do so, yeah. And alcohol alcohol's just a alcohol is an Uber driver to the dealer, man. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So just to go back to the end of the Ibiza story, did you ever think you'd sort of continue with the DJ and then, or was it very much a case of you know what? I've had my time and fifty uh, fifty. Yeah. You know, I'm a uh, yeah, fifty-fifty really. Mm. I mean, I've still played some brilliant gigs, you know mm. what I mean, and I probably still will. But do I want to be? I don't know. If, I don't know if if I want to be rolling around clubs at four or five in the morning my yeah. age. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I don't know what the legs for it. You know, I, I just I don't think I have. I mean, mm. if someone wants to fly me to an exotic location and put me in, put me up in a nice villa, and then yeah. I'm more than happy to do it, you know? <laughs> yeah. but like I say, it's not something I pursue. Yeah, I'd like to get back into making music again. Mm. When I was, unf- I mean, I'd started, I started producing again, but then my production partner she moved away, so it didn't, it didn't 
seen the same doing it without her, you know. And obviously, Man U Mission have got this book coming out relatively soon. But what was what was the story of Man U Mission towards the end? How did that how did that end as a concept? Uh, well, it's two brothers, isn't it? Mm. It's two brothers, and I think they fell out. I, I think they, from what I know, they're uh, they're still falling out. Mm. So I think because they were very different characters, weren't they? If I totally remember, different. yeah, yeah. I mean, you got Mike, who's who's funny, he's witty, he's mm-hmm. charming, he's good looking, and you have got Andy, who's like he's like the accountant, mm-hmm. you know. That's pretty much it. Nice mm-hmm. fella, Andy. Don't get yeah. me wrong, but he's you know he's he, 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 you can see why Mike and Claire were front of house. Yeah, you know what I mean, yeah, yeah. Two, you wouldn't meet, you couldn't meet two more conf- conflicting brothers. Yeah, I'm, I'm di- I got three brothers. I'm different from all of them, mm. but you you know you, you can see why we're brothers. Mm-hmm. You look like them. You know, we're all similar in our own ways, but mm. not completely different. Whereas mm. them two, just, just like night and day. Yeah, they really are co- totally different cases. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally different cases. Yeah. Was it just a concept which couldn't go on forever anyway? Would you say? Uh, nothing lasts forever, does it? Mm. I mean, it would have been pretty hard to to because Man Mission have got a pretty high quality threshold mm. to sustain that over the decades. Mm. I think it's near on impossible. Yeah. I mean, Studio 54 shut down, the Hacienda shut down. Everything that good comes to an end. Yeah. I mean, it can evolve and... And arguably, if it does continue, that it's not the same as it yeah, was yeah, anyway, yeah. is it? So, Well, nothing's ever going to be as good as it used to be, is no, it? No, no. You know, you're always going to get that brigade. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think... I don't think Mike and Claire are, are, are like, never say never. Mm. Watch this space, you never know. <laughs> so do you ever go back to Ibiza now? I've been back a few times, mm. yeah, yeah. And it's quite funny going there straight, you know what I mean? Mm. Going there sober, it's nice, yeah. beautiful. I mean, I've still got loads of friends that live there. Yeah. It's an amazing island, man, do you know what I mean? It's a nice place to go on holiday. I'm, I'll be out there this year at some point. Mm. But uh, I like prefer going to, to other places on holiday now. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you spend your days now then, Derek? Well, I work for my family. We've got a family business. Me and my brothers, we're in waste management and recycling. Mm. We sell uh, we sell machines to, to, to nightclubs, to bars, to restaurants, mm. compact their rubbish. We're like the Irish Sopranos, yeah, but without the violence. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, in, we're in waste management, yeah. So that's what I do. A mm. little bit of DJing on the side. Yep. Obviously following the boys in blue. Yeah. That takes up a big part of my uh, of the winter anyway. Yeah. Well, I was going to come back to the football, to be fair, because... We're recording this on a Saturday afternoon. I've dashed from the gym, but you've dashed straight from the KP. Straight from the game, excuse my voice, because I was shouting all day. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, hopefully this age is well, but things are looking a little bit better today. But, yeah. you know, what... That, that was a must-win game, wasn't it? And I, I was... think tomorrow, or Tuesday night, it's a must-win game as well. Yeah, I was going to say, what's, what's, your, what's your views on the season and, and Enzo as well? I love Enzo. I think he's one of the best things to happen to Leicester. And I think for people to be calling for him to be sacked are uh, just ridiculous. We have to remember, it. he's... Uh, He's young. He's a young manager. He's never, he's never managed at this level before. And, and, and have a look where we are. Mm. And that's not his team. He hasn't got his players in. Mm. He hasn't. He certainly hasn't got a striker in that that can play the way that he, he wants. He hasn't. Mm. You know. He, he, we ju- we just need to give him more time. We, we need to let him build his team. Yeah. You know the every, the players he's brought in have all been brilliant. Uh, Sometimes it can be a bit, your heart's in your mouth and they're passing it around at the back. Mm. It can be a bit methodical sometimes. But, you know, he, he wants them to keep the ball, mm. you know, and he wants them to slow it down. And that's understandable. But when you're 1 0 down, it's, it's, it, it can be a right pain in the arms. Mm. And I can see. But anyone calling for his head, they're the same people that were leaving when we were 3 0 up. Yeah. They were leaving early. Who leaves the game when you've. Well, that was the other thing I was going to ask you because. You know, I've had this conversation with a couple of the other guests as well. Leicester's fan base, or should we say the current fan base? Because you spoke about... Oh, mate. Uh, the, Filbert Street. I mean, it's, it's a very different fan base these days. Yeah, I think we're... They've got... Uh, the, half of them are entitled. Mm. I don't know whether it's they like... What were they... Were they eight or nine when we won the league? And mm. now they're like 14, 15, 16 mm. year olds. I don't know, but... Yeah, they're but really entitled, man. Yeah. They should get a grip. Yeah. You know, enjoy it for what it is. Yeah. I mean, getting relegated was the right kick in the knackers. Mm. Uh, the financial shit we're in is, is not good, but mm. 
I don't think we're the only team like that, do you? No. And there's an awful lot of supporters of other teams who, you know... Who give the right arms in the situation. Absolutely. Not booing a team off at half-time just because they're not, yeah, I've, they're not winning. I've never, uh, I've never understood booing your own team. Mm. You know, I, I just think it's, it's counterproductive. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Right. Slag them off in private, do you know yeah, what I mean? And afterwards and... Yeah, yeah. yeah between, you know, mm. it stays in-house. Yeah. Yeah, no, I've never... Uh, no. Even Brendan Rodgers, do you know what I mean? That they were like... Leicester played some of the best football that they've, that they've ever played under Brendan Rodgers. Mm. Uh, and I believe if the Adnus, if, if the Adnus had seen that, we'd have stayed up. Mm. But that's... But if we hadn't gone down, we wouldn't have got Enzo. And I think Enzo's... I, I think... He, I, I, I think... Yeah, I think we've got a really good manager. Yeah, and good it's stuff. Exciting times. So, what does the future hold for you then, Derek? Who knows, man? <laughs> Who knows? I don't know. Yeah, it's it's the uh, yeah. I really don't know, man. Mm. Any plans to return to music or? You know what? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I'd like to start making music again. Mm. Uh, yeah, I've got a few gigs coming up as well, but. Uh, yeah, I mean the music's always there. It's mm. always going to be. It's still in me, man. Of course, I mean? it's. It, it's uh, and I, I might not have the same uh, sort of drive, but yeah, I still love it as much. Mm. Still love it as much. I mean, you never know what's around the corner, man. And what's your views on Leicester as a city these days? Because obviously, it's changed a lot. Hasn't yeah, it? you know, you spoke about how sort of prosperous it was when yeah. you moved as a youngster, but yeah, unfortunately, you couldn't say that. Uh, now, listen. Some parts of the city are uh, are, are beautiful. Mm. But when you go down that towards down sort of down towards St Matthews, mm. you, get, you can get a bit sticky, can't you? Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, I was down there a couple of years ago, and it was like a, a pal of mine. He was uh, he was picking up his son from. Uh, he went there. I think he, he was kickboxing around my age range. There's a little gym down there. And yeah, I mean, what was going on on Ray? It was like something out of the wire. Mm. You know what I mean, it was like they're openly shutting drugs in the street. And yeah. Well, yeah, it was. It's it's like anywhere. Parts of it's nice. Parts of it's a shit. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much the same as everywhere, though, I suppose. You, you, you get that in London. You know what I mean? Yeah. You get that in London. No, it's uh, it's still vibrant. It's still multicultural. Mm. You know what I mean, I think it's got a lot more going for it than as than it has. Uh, Going against it. Yeah, 100%. The university's booming, isn't it? Mm. But, uh, yeah, I mean, winning the Premier League, it, it really put Leicester on the map, didn't it? Mm. And there's a lot more hotels now opening up, I've noticed mm. that. There weren't any hotels before the Premier League. <laughs> no. There weren't any hotels. So, uh, I mean, yeah. Like, I don't know if I'd live here again. Mm. I mean, my parents, they, when they moved back to Leicester, they... Uh, they moved to a place called Blaby, so I spent a bit of time there. Mm. Which is just outside the city, but it's, it's you're never far from anywhere in it. No, story. it's a small city. You can, you, you can walk around it. Pretty, everything's easy access. Yeah, I like Leicester. I don't know if I live here again. Mm. I like the people. They make me laugh. Yeah, they are. You know what I mean? They're they're that. They're, I love their cynicism. You know, they're quite <laughs> but yeah, they do make me laugh. Do you know what I mean? They yeah, do. they do. No, I'm with you on that. You know, some of the best people around are from Leicester. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there's some good characters. 100% some believe that. as well, but yeah, yeah. yeah, anyway. Last question for you, and Derek. What would, the, what would the Derek now say to that Derek as a teenager, City of Leicester school, drifting, possibly at that particular time, no idea what was going to happen in life? What, what pointers would you give him? Just enjoy it because mm. it flashes by, mm. you know? It absolutely flashes by. It only seems like it only seems only seems like yesterday I was getting ready to leave Leicester to go back to Ireland, man. Mm. And I was what, would have been fifteen, the fourteen, fifteen. Then yeah. enjoy every moment, man. Mm. Take the wins. Yeah, savor the wins. <laughs> savor the wins. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, Derek, thanks ever so much for coming down thanks today. For us, JB. Really appreciate it. You know, and like I said, you know, you got a dash back to London so I appreciate your time and it's been fascinating to speak to you great talk to you too. and uh, and I'll be in touch anyway thanks ever so much thanks, indeed Amy. cheers